Three, two, one. Number 15, Burger King foot lettuce. The last thing you want in your Burger King burger is someone's foot fungus. But as it turns out, that might be what you get. A 4 channer uploaded a photo anonymously to the site showcasing his feet in a plastic bin of lettuce with this statement, This is the lettuce you eat at Burger King. Admittedly, he had shoes on, but that's even worse. We're Sardonicast, everybody. <laughs> nice. You're good at that. Oh, thank you. So you know I who know that, what is. that is. Oh, you don't. Oh, you don't know uh, Chills. Yeah, I know that is. I, I think know. the name is funny as fuck. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have the internet. What? I'm, like, <laughs> I'm Amish. Okay. Um, uh, I'm Adam from Your Movie Sucks. Uh, I'm Alex from I Hit Everything. I'm Ralph from youtubecom slash Ralph the Movie Maker. Yeah. Yeah. We've nice. got. How's everybody? Um, good, decent. I'm okay. Good. Um, yeah, decent. Fine. Decent. I guess. That's as good as it gets for us. <laughs> <laughs> Start oh, on a really cast. Energy today. <laughs> yeah. We've got. <laughs> we've got some very exciting news, everybody. I'm. Oh yeah. Very excited about it. Um, Alex, why don't you uh, tell everybody the exciting news? Oh yes, of course. Just in time for the festivities, you know, Christmas and all that, Hanukkah, you know, all them, all them things. Uh, Sardonicast merch is finally here. Woo! Um, we got a store shed up, set up. Oh, we got T-shirts, it's a mug probably. Yeah, there's a mug. It's cool, man. There's a pillow. There's an <laughs> iPhone case. There's a pillow. There's a crew neck. Anything you could ever want is, is is in this shop. There's a hoodie. Um, there is a hoodie. What's the difference between the T-shirt and the Bella Plus Canvas T-shirt? Uh, uh, yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> they look. I think one's thinner. I guess it's just the color options. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, man. I'll order Whatever. them and let you know. Where do people find yeah. these T-shirts? I'm checking one out right now. A hundred nine dollars. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> the easiest way to find them um, is probably in the description, and I'm sure we'll share it on Twitter and everything. But the URL is shop.ritualnetwork.com slash collection slash sardonicast. You'll find it on there. You, you'll be able to find it. We'll be yes. posting it around. Hopefully. Yeah. I'm excited to wear all of our faces on my body. I'm excited to buy the pillow and sleep with both of you right next to my face <laughs> yeah why would you not want to buy it and sleep with us what, what we really need to get is sardonicast body pillows like dockies <laughs> i don't we'll know get, we'll draw the that. full body just look okay. really cuddly I'm, I'm liking this yeah i'm liking it someone would want it. it write in the comments yeah, if you want a sardonic want sar <laughs> sardoc key cast sardani makara <laughs> well <laughs> Anyway, if you if you know somebody that likes the podcast, even yourself, get some shit for Christmas, because it's great. We <laughs> we are just natural born salesmen. Can I just say yeah. that? Yeah. Well, you're gonna be walking like in public, and someone's gonna see that Sardonic has shirt, and they're gonna be like, "Oh, cool." That's how Go they know you're cool. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> we did so, it. We check did it, it guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really cool. We, there's some new movie trailers that came out recently that are oh in very, oh, very, yeah. very, very similar themes <laughs> to to the movie trailers we talked about last episode. And by that, I mean they're pointless remakes. Um, Dumbo. <laughs> with uh by Tim Burton, right? Tim I, Burton's Dumbo. Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. It's like Tim with Burton's uh, Alice in Wonderland. It was great. And Tim Burton's what was the other one he did? There was another one. Oh, Charlie and the Fa uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. That was a good one. He made Big Eyes. He's just the king of remakes, which he nobody does remembers. Yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't even see that one. Yeah. I, I don't really have anything to say about the Dumbo trailer. I just wanted to mention it because it's sad. Didn't even see it. 
Didn't even see it. I Did... saw it, but I forgot that I saw it. Did you see oh, cool. the uh, new Lion King live action trailer? It's not live action. <laughs> I know, right? We were talking about this before. It's it's 3D animated, but it's still animated. <laughs> it looks yeah, I wanna, uh, what do you think, Adam? not good. Well, here's my biggest issue with it is like, okay, you can make something photorealistic in a sense. You can be like, oh, look at the graphical capabilities and how realistic all these animals look. But at the end of the day, there's a reason why it was presented in a traditionally animated way. When you decide to go for realism in the way that this trailer is clearly going for, you're sacrificing things like facial expressions, you know, things that you mm -hmm. express through animation. Like, Pixar never does anything super realistic. Their characters are always cartoony, and that's part of why it works, right? But in this this trailer, all we see is like, wow, a real lion who I don't know how I'm going to be able to emotionally <laughs> relate to. Yeah. If you can't even tell what they're feeling at any given time. It's very uncanny valley. Everyone yeah. In that trailer. And it's also like, way too dark. They look like real animals. <laughs> yeah. Did you see Jungle Book? Like John Favreau who directed that, didn't he as well? I didn't yet, but I'm I'm going to. I don't know. That seems like slightly more interesting to me than The Lion King because the the story is told through a human character in that at least for the most part. Yeah. Whereas The Lion King, if you don't have any characters that have I don't know facial expressions, <laughs> if you don't if you don't have anything to relate to, then what what are you gonna get? And they're keeping some they're songs like in there too, it's right? Weird. I'm pretty sure they're keeping like, I just can't wait to be king. But the whole thing's yeah, so dark, it looks movie. like a fucking Zack Snyder movie in the trailer. <laughs> and they're getting ri they're getting rid of "Be Prepared," which is like the darkest song. But the whole movie is dark, and they're keeping all the not dark songs. They got rid of Jeremy Irons, but kept James Earl Jones. Lots of. Lots of questionable decisions, and I'm not sure I really want to see John Oliver as Zazu, to be honest. <laughs> I yeah, was I thinking don't. the same thing. What about Timon and Pumbaa? They're like Seth, Seth Rogen, Rogen now. And... <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, come, come in here, eat some grass. Who's <laughs> Timon now? <laughs> Do we know Timon who Timon is? is? Someone who's in Big Mouth. That's all oh, I know. Oh, what a hit like, that is. Like, I don't know. If you're gonna keep James Earl Jones, then why not keep some of the other cast members that are still alive? I can understand not wanting to keep uh, what's his face from Home Improvement because he's an adult now for like the kid Simba, but <laughs> I don't remember his name. I just Jonathan Taylor the, Thomas. Where's the fun in you know you know every beat that the story's gonna hit? Where's the where's the tension and surprise in that? Maybe they'll it's change it up. Just nostalgia bait, I guess. They won't, though. They'll add in just like 30 minutes of extra fluff. <laughs> Unnecessary fluff. See, I can watch the original movie and know every single beat of where the story is going and still enjoy it. But I'm I'm uncertain I'll be able to do that for this one. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, but when you when it already, a version of it that already exists, which you probably already prefer because it's way more visually interesting and appealing. Why would you ever bother with that? That's what I don't get about any of these. Like, did you guys see the Pete's Dragon? No. No. <laughs> that looked bad, too. What's the goddamn point, man? Well, they had Beauty and the Beast, too, and Cinderella. They do well. That's why they make them. But, <laughs> I mean, someone yeah. must get a kick out of this. It's it's the same story. I guess people just want something to see. The guy who directed <laughs> Pete's Dragon know. directed that... Uh, movie that's on Netflix right now called Ghost Story from last year starring Casey yeah. Affleck and Rooney Mara. Mm -hmm. And it was actually pretty good. And it was like, wow, this does not seem like something that would come from the director of Pete's Dragon. I guess you guys didn't because watch it. It was like but... a Hollywood studio production. They, they yeah. you know, it, it's not his movie, it's Disney's movie and he's just pointing the camera and working with the actors. It's not really his vision. I imagine same, Ghost yeah. Story is something he actually wanted to do, like a passion project. I find it amusing that they thought that Pete's Dragon was a popular enough intellectual property that they could <laughs> remake it and make money off of it. Like, I guess they learned... Well, did it make money? No, it didn't. It was like a flop. Let's see. Oh. Yeah, I don't think so. Oh. Nobody watched it. <laughs> you know, it seems like uh, a lot of filmmakers are just 
using these huge Disney franchises to just kind of get their names out there, you know, just to yeah, yeah, you know, it's just like a job for them. So then so they're they a bit of a name. They're tempted so, by yeah, Satan. So yeah, they can actually fund the project they want. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they make a deal with the devil. Exactly, yeah. that's Disney. They keep scooping up all the directors and actors who should be working on better projects. Could you imagine if they got like Charlie Kaufman to do a Disney movie? Could you imagine? Uh, I don't know if they'd get him. <laughs> they definitely limit his creativity a little bit. Exactly why he wouldn't do it. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, but I mean, some of these people got to get paid too, and to stay in these guilds, you have to work a certain amount of hours and do a certain amount of movies, so they do them. Like, oh, I'll be in the Lion King. Fuck getting paid. They don't deserve any money. They should be doing it for free. But you should <laughs> still buy our T-shirts because they look really cool. Yeah. <laughs> It's capitalism. It's, it's like um, Nicole Kidman. She's in a bunch of great stuff, but then she's in that movie that I saw this trailer for with Kevin Hart and Brian Cranston. Where Brian Cranston's like in a wheelchair. Did you see that? Well, let me look this up. What? <laughs> <laughs> do, do, you guys haven't even heard of this? Uh, I've never it, heard of it. It's like Brian Cranston and Kevin Hart, and like Brian Cranston's, uh, he can't move his legs and his arms, so Kevin Hart helps him out, and they become like friends. Looks fucking awful. <laughs> but she's in it. <laughs> she's also in uh, Aquaman. Yeah, she's in Aquaman too. These, they gotta get paid. They gotta do some dumb movies so they can do good stuff. I'm excited to see Aquaman because it looks terrible and also it's directed by James Wan for some reason. I can't wait for that. I'm hyped uh, for I'm Aquaman. I'm gonna be their opening yeah. night. It's gonna be so bad. You know, it's a apparently a really funny movie in theaters that I haven't had the time to check out is uh, the new Robin Hood. Apparently, that's like hilarious. Oh, yeah. I haven't seen it yet, oh, really? but I, I would love to catch it. I've just been busy. Been all over that the place. That looks pretty bad, too. Who's that for? Jesus Christ. I know, right? They already did like a Russell Crowe one, didn't they? Like, Yeah, and that one ago. bombed. They've done many of them. And now they have Taron Edgerton and Jamie Foxx. Yep. Oh, God. Here, let's see. Robin Hood. I want to look up how much it made. They should do a Five dollars. dark and gritty <laughs> remake of the Disney Robin Hood. Just because. Let's see. I mean, I mean, they're, they're rattling them off so quickly. That it's going to be coming up soon. I'm just upset that it's such a lucrative decision that they keep doing it. Because it's like, okay, well, we don't really have to write a script. We don't really need any ideas. Well, yeah, all the all the hard work is done for them. It's, it's br brilliant for them. Yeah, it's just printing money for just paying a bunch of animators. Low basically. risk. Yeah. Yeah, and animators don't get paid yeah, shit. It's gonna make a lot of money. Brand recognition. Yeah. Valuable names and properties. It's just lame, man. Do you know how many are coming out next year? More than five. Yeah, four of them. Oh. Four of them are coming out. Just from Disney. Twenty nineteen. Just Disney like remakes of their old movies. Yeah. Mm. Four. It's just obscene. Apparently, Ralph Breaks the Internet Sad. isn't very good. Yeah, it didn't oh, really? look very good. Yeah, yeah, the, looked, the, the trailers were embarrassing. Too. Yeah, I'm not gonna see that. It had the Emoji Movie vibe. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. It, it felt like the Emoji Movie. It felt more like the Emoji it's, Movie yeah, than. Let's go into eBay and b do some bidding, yo. Oh, that <laughs> looks that looks fun. I hope they dab in the movie. One hundred percent. Did that do well? I'm sh I'm sure it's done somewhat well. I mean, I have Robin Hood right here. Let me just let me just say how much it made. It probably quick. did. Fourteen million, and with a budget of hundred million. Oof, that's been out a, <laughs> at least a week or so, hasn't wow. it? Wow. Yeah, and that's like not counting marketing, which is like probably twenty million. Wow, right? that's so a huge flop. They they lost like a hundred million to see that actually. That's it looks fucking hilarious. amazing. Imagine just a hundred million dollars burning, just burning. <laughs> that's what's going on. What studio released that? Uh, um, Lionsgate Summit. Who made this movie? Yeah. Summit? Lionsgate um, has been really fucking struggling recently. Like... I know. Um, why? When you release Robin Hood. Well, <laughs> well, Jigsaw was good, at least. It wasn't but, good. <laughs> but I, I'm sure it made, like, <laughs> yes, it was. a bit of money. But, like, ever since the Hunger yeah. Games stopped, they weren't able to find another franchise to pick up. Like, they've been really shit in the bed when it comes to uh, getting properties. Yeah, there's no franchises really anymore in movies. Just Marvel. Well, Disney owns all of them, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> like, the, the rest yeah. of these studios really don't have much. Universal has Jurassic Park. And then, is that it? And Universal well, also has, like, 
so the animated stuff. Universal Shrek has Mini been doing and... great though. Jurassic Park. Yeah, they like been doing those good. are some of the, the what the biggest movies of all time now. Uh huh. And Halloween wise. did well. They did. Halloween, they did Halloween. Fox has been doing fine. They got the fucking Deadpool PG thirteen <laughs> coming out <laughs> soon. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. can't believe they did that. I can't believe it. Because Disney guy has them now. Disney has Fox, right? Can you yeah, explain so. this whole PG thirteen Deadpool thing they, to me? It's like a recut. So it looked like a new film, movie, but it's not. But I guess maybe they filmed a little bit more. I wonder if they'll just stop doing R rated shit now. How much of the of Deadpool 2 would even be suitable for PG-13. He says, like, swear words every three seconds. Yeah, well, they'll just change it. <laughs> they'll just redub the whole movie. The blood will be, be replaced by confetti. They'll do an E.T. and give them all walkie-talkies instead of, like, guns. <laughs> One of yeah. the lesbians will be replaced by a man. <laughs> Nobody dies. Yeah. <laughs> You're just describing an awesome movie, guys. Mm. It's right up my alley. PG-13. <laughs> Well, I guess that wraps up our depressing conversation on things coming out. <laughs> There's a lot of them. Um, Two remakes. Yeah. That's a it. A bunch of remakes. And more to come. Yeah. I hope Can't you're excited. For um, Aquaman. Oh, yeah. And another remake of something. I'm sure there'll be some other reboot or something coming out. Why don't they reboot the show Reboot? That would make sense. <laughs> Did you guys ever watch that? It was Canadian, but I think it was I think it had a bit more of a range. I guess it might be no. a, I you might be too young, Ralph. It was like it oh, was yeah, a definitely. It was the I think it might have been like the first computer animated television series. I'm pretty sure it's uh really? it was really? in Vancouver. Let's check this out. Reboot. Have you guys like 94 came out the year I was born. Oh wow. Jesus. Wow. Yeah, it was on until, I don't know. It had four seasons. But I'm not going to fact check that, but I'm pretty sure it was like the first actual computer animated television series. Fact check me. The screenshots look pretty funny. It worked. I mean, like, it was, sure, it was, you know, it's really dated now. But, like, the whole plot mm -hmm. was that they're in a computer, so it makes sense. Like Lawnmower Man. So Tron. Yeah. Tron. That's all they could do with CG back then, because it was so bad, they were just like, okay. We can't pretend it's real do, life. You gotta, you gotta go in a computer. Yeah, you can't <laughs> pretend it's real life. Yeah. You gotta go in the digital world, okay? <laughs> and then Pixar stepped it up by saying, okay, it's toys now. Oh my god, I'm watching some footage of Reboot now. This looks fucking awful. You mean awesome. <laughs> do you guys remember... Uh, no. <laughs> Did you guys watch like Beast Wars or Beasties? I, they had like two names. I don't know why. Beasties. What was that Transformers? No. Yeah. When was that? Um, I had a friend who liked it. I never saw it myself. Yeah, it was a bunch of a uh, bunch of old nostalgic nostalgic things for me. Anyway, Beast Wars, Transformers, Beast Wars. Oh my God, this looks so bad too. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. It was also a Canadian Beast production. Wars. When the fuck was this on? 1996. There we go. Yeah, it was pretty funny. The animation is hilarious. The guy... So basically, like, it was like Transformers, and they show up on planet Earth, but instead of, like, imprinting on cars, they transform into, like, robotic animals for some reason. Yeah. And they have guns. I, I see that. <laughs> it looks pretty epic. The, <laughs> I bet if I was, like, six, I'd fucking love Oh, this. yeah. I'd watch this all day. The guy who was a che cheetah was named it was named Cheetor. <laughs> <laughs> Is it CG? Yes. Or 2D yeah, it's animation? CG. Oh, really? <laughs> Very dated, but whatever. Yeah. It convinced me this when was I was like a the child. Start of that. Like all, a lot of those CG animated shows started to pop up in the early two thousands and late nineties, mm -hmm. like uh, Jimmy and Neutron, them, yep. and it, all, it oh, always fuck looked bad. Jimmy Neutron. Yeah, Jimmy Neutron, and like they're still trying it, and I guess the CG has gotten a bit better. Like that Star Wars show, doesn't look half bad. It looks better than that, certainly, <laughs> but it still doesn't look that good. I still prefer two D. Yeah, two D always better. We need a dark and gritty Jimmy Neutron reboot, live action. Yeah, I mean you joke with Steve Odekirk. We'll probably be talking about it next episode. <laughs> yeah, the guy who created Kung Pao created Jimmy Neutron. Really? Yeah. 
I never knew that. That's so cool. Mm-hmm. Kung Pao is a is an interesting one. Have you seen it, Alex? <laughs> no, I saw. Oh Jimmy my Neutron. god! Oh, it's uh, so quotable. Maybe we'll talk about it's that. It's so one day. quotable. <laughs> It's like it's one of it the is. silliest. It's it's like kind of bad. Like it's it's in the realms of guilty pleasure. Yeah, but it's it's one of the funniest, most quotable movies ever. It's it's up there, not quite as great as Black Dynamite, but like it's it's up there, especially for like nostalgia for me. Mm-hmm. Like sixty percent of it is really bad and unfunny, but there's this forty percent that's so fucking hilarious. <laughs> like you're gonna love it if you ever see it. There's gonna be points where you're gonna drop out of it a bit, but then something really funny is gonna happen and you're gonna stick with it. So what? This is a movie. Yes, it's a movie. Kung Pao Enter the Fist, right? Yeah. Yes. Steve Odekirk. Okay. There's that's, some really that's good the jokes. Guy's in name, that. right? Steve Odekirk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Bob yeah. Odenkirk's. Brother? What? Or really? I don't think they're related. Yeah, I think related. Oda Kirk and Odin Kirk. Those differently. are two last names. Yeah, they're different. Oh yeah. Oh, I yeah. always thought they were related. <laughs> Whatever. Basically, the premise of the film is Steve Oda Kirk <laughs> took some 1970s Chinese action film that. Basically, no one had seen. They bought the rights to it, and Steve Odekirk's voicing all of the characters, and um, he he uh, green screened himself into the film as the lead, and basically rewrote the story. And it's just it's really really funny. And so like there's the, <laughs> yeah. there's characters that just sound like absolute caricatures every time they talk. <laughs> it's like. I'm Ling's father. We all, we all, we all. It's just, it's, yeah. it, you, you won't get the, the full effect by me just quoting it, but it's, it's lovely. It's so funny. Yeah. It's really funny. Yeah. Man, you sold me. Oh, man. Yeah, watch it. Watch it with some friends. <laughs> it's yeah, ridiculous. Watch it with friends. Speaking of things that we watch called movies, um, we saw the new Coen Brothers film. The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. What did you guys Another think? Another funny film. Damn straight. I loved it. I think we all liked it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? we all loved it, I think. I said uh, in the Letterboxd uh, post, it's a good, funny version of Once Upon a Time. Oh, not Once Upon a Time in the West. A Million Ways to Die in the West. Oh, really? By, oh, God, uh, what's his name? Sucks. Seth MacFarlane. Seth MacFarlane. Yeah. yeah. Ugh, that movie is fucking horrendous. And unfunny. Oh yeah, and he has no the charisma. Was bad. It was the, the trailer was bad. The movie's even worse. Yeah, it is it's awful. The trailer yeah. at me at least makes it seem like it has some potential. Really, the trailer is what sold me on not watching the movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but like, let's look at it from like the least cynical point of view, where you go, okay, so he's like making fun of how brutal the West was and how people died all the time and how everyone got diseases all the time. That could be funny. That could work. And there could be some things you could do with it. And he does nothing with it. It's like uh, 10 minutes of Neil Patrick Harris shitting in a hat. But Coen oh, Brothers about that. took this theme of death and he made it, they made it fucking interesting and sad and funny. And it was amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was reading up uh, online that um, they decided to pursue Netflix eventually just because... They wanted to, they, they weren't sure about exactly how sellable it would be to have like a wide release in theaters. And they were just looking at mm-hmm. getting funding. Yeah. And by the end of it, they were like, yeah, you know, this is just a different way of uh, promoting and, and distributing a movie, but it's just as legitimate. And I think that's pretty cool yeah. because I, I, I appreciate cool. having the option. Like it had a limited release. It would have been cooler if it had a wide release, but, you know, I guess there's no point if it's on Netflix, but. And also, I don't know how many people honestly would have seen it in theaters. Right. That's true. Yeah. It is It is a weird kind of unique, different thing that they've made. And I love how they're always willing to try new things. Very crazy. And I love how the um, the first segment was where it was because it, immediately it's like, okay, this is not completely serious. If you had a different segment mm-hmm. first, then it might not be as obvious at the beginning, that yeah, it's if like, you had okay, like the segment not... with Liam Neeson and yeah. the, the the guy with no arms and legs, that's way more serious yeah. than so the like Buster Scruggs one. Breaking the fourth wall immediately. Mm-hmm. Uh, so entertaining. I loved it. Uh, yeah, I liked how they were all completely different tones and the stories and like morals behind all of them were completely different. 
Because, like, I don't know how you guys feel about the anthology movies normally, because mm-hmm. I, I don't really like the concept from the films I've seen beforehand, like VHS, you know, films like that. Yeah. yeah. Where um, it has some, like, really good segments, but all it takes is for half the segments to be bad and then half the film is, like, nigh unwatchable. Yeah. But each one of them is interesting enough on its own. Um, Some of them do seem kind of slow at first, but they always have a payoff and a meaning behind it, and it's just a joy to watch. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think that part of um, part of what increases that risk is having so many different directors on the project, like VHS. And yeah. Especially yeah. fucking ABCs of death, where just most of them are awful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But when you when you have like a, a solid, consistent voice, even if they're tonally inconsistent, you have people that see the bigger picture, I guess, or, or have the same uh, ability to curate their own content and decide what's good and what stays and what works and what doesn't. Because by the end, at the end of the day, it's like they easily could have had another segment and cut it out. You know, when you're doing a film like this, I think that it's an mm-hmm. interesting kind of way to tell stories by essentially making a theatrical version of several short films. And I would like to see more directors do it, more good directors at least. Yes, I agree. What was your guy's favorite one of the stories? I would have to say the first one would be my favorite. Yeah, I'd I'd say it too. But like, I love them all for different reasons. Yeah. Because I think the third one is fantastic too. Like that one really was gripping. Mm-hmm. The the story between Liam Neeson and the the dude yeah, who was giving poetry. One. Yeah, like I fucking love that one. But that's not the funniest one. Buster Scruggs, like that skit was fucking hilarious. That was oh, a yeah. great way to open the movie. And then I love the last skit too, where it's just you know the the car full of terrific actors, mm-hmm. all like having these long monologues about whatever. It was great. I uh, I really enjoyed the fourth one also. The digging for gold yeah. guy. Loved his. Yeah, character. No, that was uh. Was that the fourth one? That was the fourth one. The fifth one was oh, the... Yeah. Uh, the fifth one was the wife girl. Uh, yeah, the person. Wife. Not really a wife yet, but theoretically. <laughs> yeah. Eventually. Fiance, I guess. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Alex? I did really like the chicken one with Liam Neeson. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like the moral lesson behind that one. But uh, mm-hmm. we haven't even mentioned the James Franco one. It's like a short but sweet. Oh, yeah. Um, quite exciting. <laughs> that was a really one. funny one, too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. I don't want to spoil anything, but <laughs> the pans is all I'm going to say. That was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so many great moments in that movie. Yeah. I saw some people complaining that it's too dark or miserable mm. for some reason. Um, I didn't feel that at all. Cause no. like, it just it fits in perfectly. And some of them aren't as dark, you know. They've all got reasonings behind what happens in them. Mm-hmm. And like it's all it's not just like it's not like a Seth MacFarlane comedy where they're just dying <laughs> and that's like the punchline, you know? Yeah. It's a payoff normally. Plus, it was all very intentionally comical and phony looking. Uh, the way it looked, it looked very like clean and digital and kind of cheap. But I like that. I think they did that on purpose. To, In like, some ways, yeah. Yeah, to make you see through it. <laughs> see, like, you see the seams in it. But in other ways, it was the exact opposite. Yeah, in other ways, yeah. But like in terms of it's all very simple. It's all shot, you know, in plain fields, simple sets. There's points where like the buildings look fake, like the windows are painted on. That was all intentional mm-hmm. to to give it that phony feel. And that's something I loved about it too. Yeah, the the only thing I didn't like along those lines was I just hate CG deer, man. <laughs> yeah. <I> don't like it. <laughs> that was that was pretty bad. Always bugs me in any mm-hmm. any film. Specifically, like, deer. deer aren't exactly rare. It's yeah, it's always deer because you they never look good enough ever. Yeah. Well, how many boys. how many trained <laughs> deers do people have? <laughs> but it doesn't do anything. It just walks into like a river, right? <laughs> like, could you <laughs> you not just like push it <laughs> and it would just walk into it? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's like cruel to grab one of these deer out of the woods and make it act. <laughs> I, I have no fucking idea. That was literally my only gripe. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it looked pretty good for a CG deer, though. It was one uh, of the, okay, one of the better ones. I was just thinking in terms I've of seen. like, <laughs> if you go back in ten years' time and watch it, I reckon it will look pretty bad. Yeah, whereas everything else will look quite good. Yeah, I wish they'd gotten a real deer, but I well, I mean, when the rest of the film isn't exactly literal, you know, I, I feel like yeah. there's some leeway for having things like that. 
that's what made me accept it. It wasn't trying to be like this gritty Western. Yeah. They, they already made that movie. They made True Grit already. So mm-hmm. I like that they took the Western genre in a totally different direction. Mm-hmm. It felt like six Red Dead side quests. Or <laughs> I was thinking the same thing because Buster Scruggs reminds me of me in Red Dead. And I'm fucking like in the town, I just shoot everybody for no reason. Fucking yeah. throw dynamite everywhere. <laughs> I find it interesting that this film came out right when D- Red Dead is at its most popular, like Red Dead yeah. Two. Anyway, yeah, yeah. it's kind of convenient I mean, timing, I guess. Convenient, yeah. One of my favorite aspects about the movie is their dialogue. Like it's so so well written. Like these, yeah, it is. these words that are appropriate for the time period that I didn't even know existed. Like they do so much research into this shit, and they, how many Coen brothers have existed that weren't period pieces? <laughs> like, are there any? Yeah, all of them are period <laughs> like, pieces. <laughs> they love doing yeah. that shit, and they're really good at it. Yeah. The dialogue in the last one, I thought especially because it is so dialogue heavy. Mm-hmm. Just you know, the, in the little, bo- this kind of a bottle in the cart or whatever, mm-hmm. they were just sat there talking for the whole thing. Yeah, there's an awful lot of range in their d- direction throughout it. Because the third one has no dialogue at all, basically. Mm-hmm. And, you know, first one's very narration, breaking fourth wall heavy. They're all different styles of writing, and they pull them all off really well. Mm-hmm. If there's any um, complaint I would have to make about the film, I, d- I do feel as though the pacing was a bit slower in the uh, fifth segment. I felt like that one could have moved along a little quicker, especially considering all the other ones were so short. Like... Mm -hmm. The first four segments took up half the movie, and then the third segment took up like a good third of the movie or something. Yeah. I felt like this this could have been like a Netflix episodic thing Mm. where you can watch a few and then then back off from it. Because that's what I did. Because I watched watched up to the one right before the, the one with the wife. I watched up to that, and then I shut it off, and then the following day I watched the rest of them. Mm-hmm. And like I have no issues with the pacing because I watched it, you know, in two different chunks. Okay, right. I feel like it, it would have worked better like that, honestly. But yeah. I guess either way works. They wanted to call it a Coen Brothers. Yeah, film. I thought that one was slower as well, but just because I was trying to guess where is this going, you know, whereas all the other ones it seemed a bit clearer, quicker. Yeah, sort mm-hmm. of what the direction was. Um, I think if I rewatched it though, now that I know what it's all about, exactly, it might go a bit quicker. Yeah, um, yeah. That's usually how these things go. Yeah, solid, man. And no excuse to not see it if it's just on Netflix. Yeah, yeah watch it. Exactly. Unless you don't have Netflix. What are Who you, doesn't? Loser? What are you, poor? <laughs> 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 what, can you not afford it? Because you got to buy food? Yeah. Netflix has released some good films this year. They have. I'm proud Roma's of them. Roma's coming out oh, next yeah. month on Netflix. That I'm really excited for. Yeah. yeah. No, because I was, I was hyped to see that, and I thought, oh, when's it going to come out here? But goddamn, it's just going to be on Netflix. It's amazing. Yeah, it, there there are a lot of benefits towards having a film released on Netflix, because it's like when they own the actual title, they're not going to region lock it. You know, the only, yeah. mm-hmm. the only times you have region locked content on Netflix is because of fr- distribution rights from uh, other companies. And that's always a piss off did you guys get um annihilation on netflix like, yes. as it came out um, well not, i don't know when it came not out when it came out in theaters because um i don't think it got a theatrical release here but it was released on netflix around the same time huh. as it mm-hmm. came out cinemas in america so yeah that was an here. interesting choice mm. and i think it paid off for it uh from what i know <laughs> like about it like it, it didn't make its money back i think in the theater but yeah. I think a lot of people saw it on Netflix. And it I don't know like how that. Uh, I, I really don't know. I don't know if I don't know if the titles on Netflix make a commission based on how popular they are, or if they're just yeah, bought I don't, I don't from the it. service and then have a license period and say we're going to pay you this much for a year or something. I'm not exactly sure how all that works. Yeah, I don't know either. But either way, I mean, like if you have something that's successful on Netflix, then that helps your career. That's for sure. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are going to see it. And Annihilation is great. Just saying. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so was Cloverfield Paradox. Speaking of good science fiction. Yeah. The best Netflix. Yeah, that's them. Film. Yeah. They got mostly bad stuff, but whatever. That's most services and companies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. 
we were talking like earlier this year, like Netflix has nothing but shit, <laughs> but they got better. Yeah. You know, toward the end of the year, the good stuff starts to come out. Yeah. It's just the it reflects movies, you know, it's like no different at the cinema when you yeah, go exactly. there. The majority of stuff that's playing is going to be shit. Mm-hmm. But then there's some good <laughs> stuff. The new Charlie Kaufman thing is uh, for Netflix. Yeah. That's really? awesome. Yeah. It's an adaptation of a book called I'm Thinking of Ending Things, written by some Canadian guy, and I don't know mm. exactly what he's going to do to it. I haven't read this novel, but yeah, apparently it's a be like Netflix adaptation? film. <laughs> I have adaptation. no idea what he's going to do about with it. Script again. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm excited for that. I don't know. Yeah, there's also uh, Scorsese's making something for Netflix. Oh, shit. Oh, really? Yeah, De Niro and Joe Pesci are in it, from what I know. I think so. Fucking so, everybody's getting on board. Well, because everyone understands now. That's the future. Everyone's on Netflix. If you want to get something seen, go on Netflix or Amazon. Mm-hmm. The fucking theaters. What's in the theaters? Aside from Justice League and, and Black Panther yeah. and... Annoying people. Ant-Man and annoying people. And the, uh, Yeah, the barrier to Disney entry remake. is so low. <laughs> you know what really fucking sucks? There's those like VIP theater things in Canada where it's like, okay, so we have the uh, Cineplex chain and then we have certain theaters that are like, okay, you get to like eat and drink in the movie. They're comfy seats, less people, whatever. But if I'm visiting my parents for like Christmas or something, because we don't live in the same province and they want to see a movie and it's like, okay, well, what's in theaters right now? Every time it's just like Disney because they they have the Christmas market, especially like not even just Christmas. It's just like... All the fucking time, if you want to see it in this VIP theater, you got to see a shit movie. Very rarely do they play something that's not going to be some blockbuster dumb thing. I think the last one I saw in VIP theater was Venom. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's really annoying. It's crap. It's like, it I is. want the theater experience, but I want to watch a good movie too, <laughs> you know? Yeah, just go home. Just go home and watch something. Exactly. Fucking anything on Amazon or Netflix is going to be better, and you can have a nice sound system. And a projector now. You can get a projector for $100. Hmm. It's not <laughs> going to be a good projector for $100. Uh, well, it's Cyber Monday. So <laughs> probably you could find a decent one. Oh, yeah. So it's okay to cyber bully today. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't can't get question the, cap the future off. of this one. You know? Mm-hmm. Like, is it just going to become a sort of a exclusive... Well, it's just going to be Disney movies, isn't it? Big blockbusters. And yeah. the sort of middle has fallen out, hasn't it? And the lower sort yeah, of Yeah, but how long can well. those movies do well? You know? Like, um, how long are people going to see Marvel movies for? I know a long time. I, I, I like Marvel too. But is there going to be a point where people get sick of it 20 years from now? And then what do they have after that? They'll, they'll just snatch up, won't they? But I don't know. And Star Wars as well. Yeah. Prince money. Which people already already want them to reboot Star Wars because they hate it. <laughs> 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 I mean, I don't know. You just don't know what these things. And then anything else Disney makes, aside from Star Wars or Marvel or their animated stuff, like it just doesn't do well. Like Wrinkle in Time or uh they had some the Nutcracker movie. Like even they have bombs. Yeah, oh, I, I guess it's know. uh I guess it's kind of a no-brainer why they keep doing all these remakes is because those are the ones that make money and they don't have any actual yeah. ideas anymore. Yeah. No. Well, because they don't even want to risk new ideas because if they do, they're going to fucking lose hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> I think so, they're doing fine. <laughs> yeah, but still, why would you greenlight something you know is going to do bad? Yeah. Like a wrinkle in time. Yeah. <laughs> Did you watch it's that? It's interesting. No, not yet. I, uh, I do want to see it one day, though. Yeah. It was very boring. I bet. Yeah, that was my fear. I didn't even want to watch it for the funnies. Yeah. I think it was I think it was a uh, less satisfying theater experience than Slender Man. Mm. Wow. God. And I can't even be bothered to watch Slender Man. It would be my least favorite of the year. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Can't wait to see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you really sold me on that one. Mm-hmm. Good job, Disney. Well, I guess we don't really have anything more to say about Buster Scruggs. Um, <laughs> it's awesome, yeah. man. It really, it's just a great yeah, it's, experience. It's a very you good movie, yeah. Really refreshing after Venom. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, oh, a real movie. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. They make those? <laughs> there was a uh, 
thing that I guess we wanted to mention, even though we don't know what the fuck we're talking about, but apparently there's this Article 13 thing happening in the EU. Yeah. Does that affect the UK, Alex? Yes. Okay. I'm pretty sure it affects so what is, all of the... How does Brexit work then? I thought Brexit was like... The <laughs> U... I we don't, don't understand even know how anything. Brexit works. <laughs> well, of course I don't. <laughs> it uh, doesn't concern me. No, no, I'm saying... No, <laughs> no, I'm saying we don't understand. Oh. Brits don't even understand how it works. Or like... Mm. <laughs> what's happening with it every headline every week is like this glacial move has happened to do with brexit and it's like jesus christ the referendum was years ago now and we haven't even left <laughs> yeah <laughs> nothing's changed completely inept yeah because it's literally split down the middle like half the country really doesn't want it and the other half doesn't supposedly split the well, country in half could do that i suppose half brexit half not Brexit. <laughs> I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> anyway, Article 13 is apparently some new copyright bill, kind of in the same vein as like SOPA and PIPA, where a bunch mm. of old farts are uh, legislating things that they don't understand. And um, <laughs> apparently it's going to take a huge blow uh, for content creators on YouTube, particularly ones in the uh, EU. Mm -hmm. Or it has the potential to. We don't know what's going to happen, but I don't think it's actually come into law yet. I think they're still voting on it. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the end of January. I'm very uninformed about this, but there are a few YouTubers that are that have made some videos on the subject. Uh, I've watched a couple of them, so go check it, them out and be informed. Just search up Article 13 on YouTube. Uh, sorry that we can't be the bastion of information for this, because we don't know what the fuck we're talking about, but yeah, we're um, dumb. We don't, figured don't that uh, <laughs> any insight from us. It would at least be a good idea to mention it so that people could look it up for themselves um, and hopefully get some yeah. traction and contact their representatives and be like, yo, what are you doing? Stop. So It is scary that it's always these people that barely understand the internet making all the laws for it, you know? Yeah. Trying to copyright memes and stuff. Like, god damn it, guys. Just yeah, we have to copyright just everything. Go to bed. Go to bed and die. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. All of these are all under the premise that like the entertainment industry is not making enough money already. Like that's <laughs> know, the only reason why these things industries come in into play. Planet. Yeah. Like it's, they didn't it's even a, get one hit, of the reasons the why it crisis. keeps going. It's like all of us watch these things and talk about them on the internet, and that's gained so much publicity for these things. Yeah, it makes, it's free advertising. It makes exactly. It's free advertising, and then even they're like, no, a, we don't want it. What are you, you fucking know, even dumb? Even if you make a, a video on something that sucks, people are going to go out and watch it just out of curiosity because people are talking about it. You yeah. know? Just, people yeah. want to be part of the conversation. People like talking about things. That's the biggest marketing tool you have. You think people watch something because they see a fucking billboard? They go on the internet and talk about it. <laughs> Fucking dummies. I think the people voting on this watch things because they see a billboard. But <laughs> Yeah, because they're from yeah. fucking the 1950s. Yeah. <laughs> Saw fucking Fred Flintstone smoking cigarettes on television. That's what they're fucking used to. They think, they think kids our age still watch ads on TV. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they're fucking crazy. <laughs> Fuck, man. My my cable subscription is just for the Oscars now. <laughs> <It's very sad. laughs> right. I wish I could cancel Literally. it most of the year. <laughs> but I can't. I, I used to have the HBO, but now I just have the HBO internet service. HBO Now, whatever the hell it's called. Like, just mm -hmm. the internet version of it. Like, no one my age or in this age range watches TV. The yeah, fuck? I don't even have a satellite dish. Yeah, we watch it online. Yeah. FX Now and... HBO Now and Showtime Anytime, like, that's what we do. Pretty much do. anything you could watch on TV at this point is on iTunes anyway. Right. So it's like, I would yeah. rather just pay for something and have it and watch it when I want with no commercials than go through the hassle of, like, recording all, all of these things money. on a hard drive that you can't even, like, copy things over onto, where, like, if your hard drive fails, you can't even recover any of your shit anymore. Like, there's so many fucking DRM restrictions and... It's really annoying. Like, the, the industry is killing itself. I know. They're like that fucking robot in The Incredibles that's, like, stabbing yeah. itself. I guess you don't remember that. <laughs> I don't no, I, I remember, remember that. Of course I do. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> they just don't want to take any responsibility. They just don't understand what's going on. No, they're out of If they touch. embraced it, it would just it would only help them. Yeah, of you course know? it would. It's like the taxi they're lobby. Not, if they're not making all the money, then they're not happy. If they're losing two pennies, then they want to just reform everything. Yeah. Yeah. Cable's so fucking expensive too. And it's for a, bunch a worse of shit service. You don't want. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let me just get one channel. Make make the two dollars or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. Pick out the channels I want. Whatever. All right. We'll see. More depressing talk shit. About, <laughs> talk about a movie? I guess so. <laughs> Is that what we do on this podcast? Sometimes. Well, I guess it was my choice this time. Mm-hmm. And I picked a movie I know you guys love. <laughs> um, AI, artificial intelligence, was my pick, and we're going to be spoiling the whole movie, I expect. Um, so yep. be wary of that. Before we go into it, um, I guess I'll give a brief synopsis of what AI artificial in- intelligence is about. By the way, I, I hate the name. Thanks for saying the whole title. <laughs> yeah, the name, the movie that's so confused, its its own title had to reiterate its own name because <laughs> they were scared people would confuse it with steak sauce. Uh-huh. You know that's you know yeah. that's the actual reason. That's yeah. funny. They did like a a test or whatever and people thought it said a1 for a1 source that's why it's got that <laughs> stupid elongated name they should have just called it bicentennial boy why didn't they just call it artificial intelligence i <laughs> guess that's have... an easier whatever, <laughs> compromise isn't it <laughs> but the uh the story is about a, a world um in the far future humanities pretty pretty fucked to be honest like new york's underwater and we're highly reliant on ais i guess mostly primitive but a sort of new experimental design uh, comes about sort of like a child um and the idea is this family who have a super ill kid sort of inherit or do they buy it i guess it's just like well the company test. gives it to them yeah, the husband is working for the company that designs them, and they decide that he's the perfect uh, candidate to basically be a, a beta tester or basically just take home this fresh new line of child AIs. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah. this guy would that be perfect love. for this. And he already works for the company, so. That's the and ticker. before that point, um, AI in this universe had never been allowed um, to have sort of programmed artificial affection or love Mm -hmm. so the idea is that he's the first robot that can imprint on the on a parent figure yes so the whole film is sort of a deconstruction of uh identity and love and affection and Mm -hmm. if if robots you know it's a it's the age-old question if robots can if they can simulate love perfectly um is that love or not you know or is Mm -hmm. it just a robot pretending exactly and how do we feel about AI artificial intelligence? Are we mixed on it? I'm mixed. I'm I. <laughs> I I'm kind of conflicted because I found the film really entertaining. Mm-hmm. I was yeah. never bored. Um, it's over. It's nearly two and a half hours long, but it just flew by for me. Yeah. Steven Spielberg's direction is super solid throughout yeah. throughout the whole thing um it's Absolutely. got tons of like really interesting ideas loads of fantastic scenes props sets really creative in a lot of ways you mm-hmm. can see well, i'm sure we'll get into the whole kubrick spielberg thing in a minute but i was under the impression that this film is kind of hated by a lot of people it is i can see why but... um but i really didn't feel that way at all for it's kind of brilliant in a lot of ways i thought Mm -hmm. what do you guys think before we sort of go into the interesting things about it uh i liked it i think it has a lot of merit like you said i think it's confused and a little messy and i think the second half isn't as good as the first half of it because the first half mainly focuses on that that age-old question kind of kind of robot love and you see the the formation of this bond between the mom and the and the kid and that was all excellent up to when he's given away. And then uh, I, the movie kind of meanders, I think. I, the, it's trying to 
be like a fairy tale and it has the logic of a fairy tale it's pinocchio they bring up mm-hmm. pinocchio a lot it's not the, it's not all mm-hmm. that subtle but like once it got into the second half where he's trying to chase down this blue fairy which is like a metaphor for consciousness i guess or like uh the or ability like God, to, you know. yeah the ability to have you know to have a goal which is what mm-hmm. they wanted it to have i don't know if i found that as interesting and then the last part with the aliens I thought was fucking crazy. And <laughs> I don't know how to feel about that either. Because mm-hmm. it's well, kind of uh, yeah. bizarre and I like things that are that bizarre. But at the same time, it kind of felt like a like a cheap excuse to have a happy ending. Uh, if we put a pin on the ending for a sec, can we come back to that? Yes, um, absolutely. Mm-hmm. There's, a lot, there's a lot to dissect, I know. But yeah. that's just so like Ralph, just quickly before Adam it. says his initial thoughts, you liked it more this time did you? I did because you had it as like a two star I, I did the first remember. time but I think this time I, I went into it more expecting I knew what I was expecting this time and I tried to yeah. embrace it more and it's like a really well made movie everything the music is fucking great all of the acting mm-hmm. for the most part's good there's some corny dialogue but again it's it's along the lines of like a fairy tale logic so it didn't really bother me as much this time Mm-hmm. Um, like the first time I saw it, I didn't, I didn't know any of the fairy tale stuff till, you know, once they start mentioning it in the mm-hmm. movie, yeah. which is like 40 minutes in, but you know, I, I, I appreciated it more, a lot more this time. Okay. And Adam? Um, I, uh, this movie, regardless of its flaws, it always has held some sort of special, I guess, uh, sentiment for me. It, uh, mm-hmm. Ralph, you're going to hate me for saying this, but part of the reason why I wasn't completely blown away by Ex Machina is because a lot of the same philosophical concepts were in this film and, and got me to think about them at a much younger age. And although mm-hmm. it didn't explore them in an as artistic of a way, I guess, or as subtle of a way, I still value this movie quite a lot for tackling those concepts and I, I like it overall it's definitely flawed there's a lot of choices that I wish they had reconsidered or changed um, and I agree with you the the first segment of the film like that easily could have just been a short film like one of the best short films ever made and just yeah. ended ended when she gave him away or something like that all of that was relatively brilliant and it, it, the tone of it was so creepy and it, it it was just disturbing and unsettling, and it, it, it I think it achieved exactly what it was going for. But then after that point, it starts to turn a bit more into a Steven Spielberg movie, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know, like running around Not a good and there's way. These, these fucking dudes on motorbikes with glowy helmets and throwing nets at them, and and like they're basically like Power Ranger villains and shit. Like it, it got cheesy, that's for sure. I reckon that's the goofiest part of the movie. Those <laughs> yeah dudes. Is the most like two thousand and one thing. Yeah, like Spielberg's uh, cheesiness gets old toward like the the later half of his career, and this is like that, like the corniness. I I didn't like it. Yeah, <laughs> as much as I would in a movie like E. T., where that was like you know fresh back then. Mm-hmm. I don't know, but it's, it kind of does fit into the fairy tale aspect, you know. Yeah, I I agree with what you said. Uh, Adam about Ex Machina, mm-hmm. but this is going for something totally different than Ex Machina. Oh yeah, this, they're completely different. The main, different the main movies, character sure. is a is a kid, so mm-hmm. to tell it like a fairy tale, it works a lot better for a story like this than Ex Machina. I, I think it's just as artful. It's just mm-hmm. you know the the way they told the story fits this story better, mm-hmm. I guess. But uh, yeah, I, I agree with you that Ex Machina okay. basically told the same story as this and changed elements of it it well like, yeah it was the, the same robot tricked you instead of actually having emotion or you know what if it had emotion and then tricked you anyway it was the same philosophical concepts yeah exactly explored differently yeah so what do you guys think of the you were saying it feels very spielbergy um because i reckon this film it's like the least Spielbergy film. Oh yeah, that too. The, the bunch of them. Parts of it's, it are very It's really Spielberg-y. unlike him. Um, it's really creepy, um, really horrific. And you said the ending's like kind of corny and happy, but I, I saw it as the complete opposite. It's 
a miserable ending, I thought. <laughs> in, in like in a perfect intended way. I thought it was yeah. bittersweet. Yeah, it's I didn't consider it to be miserable or happy. Somewhere in between. I don't know. It's like the kid dies, so how do we make this happy? Like, like as happy as we can. And they're like, I don't know, aliens. Aliens who create a fake reality for the living. It's well, fine. well, you know that. Like, I don't you know, know how I feel about aliens, that. right? Yeah, but they're, you know, they they're look just like aliens. machines. They're like robots that have um, developed past any f form that we could actually recognize. Mm. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I always just thought they were aliens, but I was doing some reading, and they're actually supposed to be machines, like robots. That's why oh. they're so sympathetic towards David, because they okay. see him as like a previous kind of incarnation oh. of what they, they became. I think the issue with that probably is the just the visual design of them. They look so similar to aliens, you know, yeah. the big heads yeah. and the slender bodies. They and look stuff. just like the um, Close Encounters aliens, which is also Spielberg. Yeah. <laughs> so. And I, I like the foreshadowing of like the first time you see David, he looks like one of those yeah. mm -hmm. those that, aliens yeah. from the end. It's I love really the clever. way they shot David at first to make him look creepy. Like you'd see his reflection on the table. You know, he, his face would always be obscured by glass or something. Just mm -hmm. you, you, he always looked alien and weird, and you never really trusted him. Haley Joel Osment was the perfect person to cast for this, for sure. Yeah, what a creepy kid. <laughs> I thought he was incredible. Yeah, me yeah. too. I thought he was, he was so great. brilliant. Now he looks even creepier as an adult. <laughs> <laughs> I saw one Eric Andre. That's the last time I've seen him. That, that's fucking hilarious on that. I just love the spin on making the film be about how humans treat AI instead of the typical AIs going crazy and enslaving humanity kind of thing. It's more mm -hmm. about the, you know, the moral and philosophical uh, battle there because the humans kind of the villains are kind of the villains in the movie yeah yeah they're quite selfish they they use ai for like their their own fulfillment like the the parents kind of in a selfish way use it to sort of get over their kid you know mm -hmm. framing for murder <laughs> um yeah and there's that scene where the robots are like being tortured in that horrible like circus thing that's kind of cheesy though they're just like yeah. Yeah, but that that's still like the humans are the the evil presence in the movie somewhat. And I think the idea was um trying to make David or well, the irony of making David the most human character mm -hmm. where everything else around him is is inhuman and cold and mean. And this cuz I'm pretty sure I found like a this huge Q&A interview thing to do with everything that went on behind the scenes with um Stanley Kubrick and all his pre-production for the movie because we haven't even we haven't even touched on that part yet no like, well that's fascinating that's such a huge aspect yeah um i suppose we should probably explain that first um, yes. for those who don't know the whole film is Stanley Kubrick's idea he he developed it for it must have been decades yep. maybe a decade and a half the only thing that was holding him back was the the visual effects um that he cuz i think he had the idea in the early 90s or so maybe a bit earlier and the film that convinced him that it would be possible was Jurassic Park mm -hmm. so of course and he became good friends with Spielberg at the time and they developed the project together worked on it a bunch and that's how Steven Spielberg kind of came into being the final director on the film because of course Kubrick died yeah um, he would have most likely directed it don't you think if um if he didn't yeah. die he would have hopefully probably made it after I watched Shot. I mean, mm -hmm. it would have been, been really interested cool to see it. You see the you see echoes of Kubrick in it for sure. You see, I'd the say more Kubrickian than echoes. Influence. It's like yeah, the whole thing is is it's it's almost like Spielberg's love letter to Kubrick. Yes, for you know, sure. It's, it's almost like Spielberg yeah, dealing you know, with in his a death, weird way. right? Because the whole film's about death and grief and dealing with that kind of acceptance, you know. Yeah, but it's definitely a Spielberg movie. I think it had his style. His style, like he wasn't trying to copy Kubrick, ah. like J.J. Uh, Abrams tried to copy him with Super Eight. Like it, he did his, to he did totally his own thing with kind it. Kind of, but I it think. also, I mean, out of every movie he's made, it seems the most like him trying to make a Kubrick movie. I feel like there's a lot of that in yeah. there. Yeah, but it's not just like the shameless homage or yeah, with something like Super Eight, it's more 
shameless and how it's just kind of captured yeah. the same magic for this it mm-hmm. felt more genuine and more like of a a respectful yeah, exactly. kind of yeah. yeah you know interpretation of of his work and and what he was envisioning for it because i think he wanted he wanted to do it justice you know because he yeah. knew what kubrick wanted mm-hmm. out of the movie and he wanted to do his best and obviously he has his own talents and it's just kind of the product of that love child of the two yeah when uh when kubrick had reservations about uh the capabilities of computer animation it was because he was unconvinced that any real child actor would be able to properly perform as david that was what that was his reservation with computer animation because his idea was to completely computer animate the robot like the the child and I oh. guess he just didn't really have high expectations for child actors. <laughs> yeah. Because, so I mean, like, Haley Joel Osment did a fucking great job. So, obviously, yeah. Kubrick was wrong about that. Or, I guess, just Haley Joel Osment didn't exist yet. But that was, that's that's kind of interesting that he wanted to completely computer animate the child, too. Mm-hmm. He wants something very different, I yeah. think. Well. That's the thing. Like, I don't know how different it really would have been. Um we can only a, speculate. A CG kid it would have been no, a totally no, I, different I, I, movie. No, I mean, I mean <laughs> he might just, have changed uh, his mind. Kubrick's. Oh, just in general. Kubrick's yeah. like, yeah, what his interpretation of the same ideas would have been. Because I think I remember reading Spielberg's input was like the torture circus scene and stuff, and he liked all the vicious, I guess, gory is the right word for it, even though it's not, you know, bloody or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, he liked that kind of stuff because um, the, I guess people think the schmaltziness comes from Spielberg when actually a lot of it did come from uh, Kubrick's original work on the on the pre-production mm. of the film. Yeah. They wanted to tell like a fairy tale from the get-go. Yeah, although I although um apparently like in his treatment the mother of the kid was like an alcoholic or something and oh. the kid would make her like cocktails and stuff. So in the ending he would like <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it was supposed yeah. to be Bloody Marys instead of coffee. Yeah, that's it's the pretty one. funny. I forgot about that. I feel like if Kubrick had directed it, it would have been more cold and sort of yeah, cynical. It's, yeah, cynical like, is a good he, word. He for looks it. up to his mother, but his mother's a flawed person too. But in this, again, it's she's perfect, or you know, she's conflicted. She's not perfect, but she's not an alcoholic. Certainly, mm-hmm. there, there's no real way to tell exactly what a Kubrick film of this would have been like. In my mind, I'm just going to assume it would have been a better movie because I like Kubrick more, but who knows? Really, who knows? You can never tell. Yeah, yeah. It's such an out-there idea, you know? There's so much speculation online as to what Kubrick was responsible and what he wasn't. And basically, most of the places that people are having this conversation, it's people just going, I didn't like this scene, so this was probably Steven Spielberg's idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when there's really, like, it's it's not really that uh easy to tell there's a lot of mystery surrounding it say the the film is the exact same but kubrick did direct it Mm -hmm. would people like it more i don't know just because of the name yeah you know i i don't know because i don't think it would have been the same (laughs) so a lot of the laughably corny dialogue felt like spielberg (laughs) yeah like again i can't discern it as clearly as joss whedon and Zack snyder in the justice league movie but the end with the British narrator, he's like, for the first time in his life, he goes to a place where dreams are born. It's like, I don't fucking know if he would have included that. But you know, I guess you never That's you the just direct don't know. fairy tale um, theme, though, isn't it? Like, it starts like a yeah, fairy tale and it ends like one. Uh, if we got a Kubrick yeah. version, it would have had David uh-huh. doing the Kubrick stare. It's the slow zoom, <laughs> fucking face down. It would have killed the mom at the yeah. end. <laughs> Red rum on the mirror. Yeah, I don't know. Who knows? Because, like, even even if we're to say, like, okay, here's what was in the Kubrick version, doesn't the guy, like, constantly change and rewrite his own scripts anyway? Who knows what the final product would have been? Yeah, that's the yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. 2001 was a very different movie the month before it came out. He fucking got rid of narration and all kinds of stuff. He changed the score, like, last minute. <laughs> he, he was changing stuff all the time yeah. before the movies came out. You just don't know. The kid in Barry Lyndon, the, uh, what's his fucking face? Lord L- Bullington? Lord Bullington. Yeah, like, Steve, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Kubrick 
I found out by watching this Netflix documentary, I forget the title, I think it's called uh, Film Worker. Kubrick initially didn't have him being as major of a character, but then he was so impressed with the guy for like actually going over his lines and doing a good job. He's like, you know what? I'm going to make you more of a main character and write in a whole bunch of scenes for you. Like after they had already started <laughs> filming. And it worked out. <laughs> so me too. That's a very interesting documentary, though. I would recommend it. Yeah, I checked that out. It's on Netflix. We got to talk about the ending. I, I feel like the ending is one of the most contentious parts that has people yeah. arguing about it, right? Because, um, of course, after uh, David gets to the statue of the fairy, it sort of cuts to 2,000 years later or whatever it is, and mm -hmm. the, the, the super robots unfreeze him and then fulfill his last wishes, and then he dies. And you were saying it, it's, you feel it's schmaltzy, I guess, or too happy, or what? Yeah, I think it's schmaltzy. The music and the the aliens sitting down with him. Well, not the like what you said, the high tech robots that look like aliens sitting down with him on the bed. I I thought it was all corny, and it went on for really long. It, it was like it felt like a half hour of that part. I didn't like it, <laughs> but go on about what you liked about it. I like the sort of irony of it because it's the moment the whole movie David has been this kind of instrument for um fulfilling other people's needs and wants you know um and it's finally mm -hmm. being spun around so he can get what he wants because of the the higher being being the more advanced AI is where everything sort of yeah. comes to a head and it's also the the payoff of him sort of becoming a real boy in, in, in the sense that I guess he kind of decides to end his life and there's nothing more human than sort of accepting the end, you know, as opposed to being a mm -hmm. infinite living machine. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, I kind of like the bittersweet, as Adam said, sort of nature of it. But yeah, just the biggest problem I have is the design of those creatures, you know, the Ro super robots because I think it is confusing because I think most people think they are aliens I always the one thing I remembered about this film because I'd only seen it once years ago was well that bit with the aliens at the end was weird didn't really get that <laughs> it so is bizarre it yeah. and researching it it is a it is an odd choice yeah mm -hmm. the CG wasn't too good either the the most of the effects of this movie are very good uh, yeah, some yeah, of them are a bit say. dated yeah some of them uh, but, but for yeah, the time really like cool, holy crap there's some really cool effects Insane production value for the time, great CG for the time, but as it is right now, it's like it would be acceptable for like a low budget film, like an indie movie. It'd be yeah. like okay, yeah. Uh, you... Even even if it didn't look real, it it was very inspired. Mm -hmm. Like the opening when the girl's face came out, like her face opened up. They're like, oh, that looks cool. It doesn't look real, but I mean, it was interesting. At least it wasn't like all green screen mm -hmm. shit. <laughs> I didn't really like no. that one shot where they were clearly just showing off the computer animation. You know, when the yeah. where it's like you can see through her head when the robot girl oh, is that, running yeah. away. It's like, okay, that's a trailer shot, I guess, but <laughs> fine. Yeah, but it doesn't age well. Yeah. All the props and, you know, uh, physical models they built were really impressive, though, I thought. Yeah, I like the depiction of the future. You see all kinds of different parts of you see the city you see like rural life you see the labs it all looked cool i like the way they depicted the future in it too yeah i have my issues with it i guess but well it's... some of it's a little dated like how the how the place is called cyberdronics wasn't it wasn't it called something like that something like that like they use lingo that people now would never fucking say like oh it's a cyber boy <laughs> like no one would fucking say that now did you guys notice how similar it was to uh, Astro Boy, it's like the same story. I didn't story. see it. Yeah, yeah. I have no <laughs> idea <laughs> anything about Astro Boy. <laughs> Wasn't Nicolas Cage in Astro Boy? In the movie that came out, yeah. Yeah, the the animated one. Yeah, that's all I know about Astro Boy. Is that <laughs> movie? I find it funny how they totally just missed where the future was going. In at least one sense, they go to the fucking the doctor where you have to pay to Google, and Jude lies like, in this day and age information is the most expensive thing <laughs> like oh yeah, it's yeah like it's the exact opposite but 
<laughs> for me, the biggest miss, it all right. the biggest miss in terms of stuff like that was um, in one of the scenes where I think they're just eating breakfast and the mother's reading a newspaper. I thought that was like a, a bit of an oversight. <laughs> they got like insane technology with robots and machines, and she's reading a, a physical newspaper. I thought that was odd. Yeah. I found it. Uh, there, there's some ways where it kind of um, did predict accurately where things were going. Like when she, um, when she was saying as they're leaving the house and leaving David there, she's like, "Okay, the uh, when we leave, all the doors and windows will go smart." So like a smart home thing, but that didn't exist in like two thousand. Yeah. What one? What was the year? This came out. Two thousand one. It came 2001? out. Two thousand one. Like, she said. She said it'll go smart. I'm like, oh, that's like smart home. But did they have smart homes? They're just called smart homes now. Did they have smart? Animals? I don't know. Yeah. The fact that they got smart, like, predicting the smart home term is actually pretty cool. They predicted global warming before Al Gore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was that was funny too. New York City's underwater. And the only thing left are the Twin Towers. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, of course. They didn't see that. Yeah. Times. That year. <laughs> Oops. This is off topic. Did you ever see the video about how uh, Back to the Future predicted 9-11? What? <laughs> I highly recommend that video. Just a side note. Go go watch that ASAP. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. Mm. Yeah, there's... um. <laughs> Anyway. There's there's a couple design choices that I, I found to be like odd, like this uh, three wheeled car where it's like okay now I don't have a trunk and the car can flip over more easily. Like when's that going to be yeah. practical? Three wheeled car? Come on! That was like Mr. Bean shit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very we need to make the car look sci fi. Exactly. Kind of decision. Yeah, some yeah. of those choices bug me. I guess I was hip at the time. Like minority reports like that too. Mm. Uh, a few movies from that era that depict the future like that. It wasn't until like her that they started changing Reading that depiction back. of the future. Yeah. Minority Report is also Steven Spielberg though, right? Yeah, so, mm -hmm. it is. Yeah, her I've was got great. A, um, a fascinating like quote from. I found this website called visualmemory.co.uk, which is like a, a big Q and A where they've compiled a bunch of information from like the 90s where all this these tidbits were coming out about the production of this movie um because of course people are obsessed with it and have all these theories and you know all that kind of stuff mm. but it was about um kubrick's kind of weird obsession with the fairy tale thing if i'll just read it for you guys oh yeah because he kept bringing in all these different writers and you know people to do their own treatment on the on the work. So Kubrick's final collaborator on the AI script was English novelist Sarah Maitland, whom he felt was necessary in shaping the story into a cohesive whole. He says, by the time I came to the project, it had become a norm. No, sorry, she said, by the time I came to the project, it had become enormous, unwieldy and unfocused, said Miss Maitland, upon pursuing the piles of unfinished scripts. Uh, mm. Scripts, she concluded that the story needed to make emotional sense as a myth or fairy tale does and believes that Kubrick realized this. In fact, Kubrick also was adamant that the story should work in terms of myth. He never referred to the film as AI. He always called it Pinocchio. Huh. He decided to make this film because he wanted people to shift to a more positive view of AI. He was quite open to me about that. Kubrick was fascinated by artificial intelligence and was very fond of robots which he regarded as a more environmentally adaptable form of human being. He Fuck said, you, I Stephen think of Hawking. Them as I'd like to think of my great grandchildren. <laughs> and he's very fond of his grandchildren. So I thought that kind of adds a new context to what the film's going for. It does yeah, kind of it does kind of achieve a flipping it all on its head, you know. Mm -hmm. Are you guys like super yeah. worried about the uh, AI robot takeover? Um I mean we don't know. What's gonna happen? I'm but fine a lot with of it. smart people seem fucking worried. Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine with it too. I'd honestly like to upload my consciousness to a robot. I think that'd be fucking cool. I feel like but the actual the me. actuality of it would be way more kind of boring than you know, they're not gonna have like big spaceships flying around enslaving people. It'll probably just more <laughs> be like some super intelligent AI system that just exists virtually, just controls all you know, like water supplies and electricity and stuff and just controls oh. people that way. 
Like that Johnny Depp movie like that nobody's. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh yikes! Uh, yes, oh, <laughs> where he decided yeah. he needed to continue using his human face. Yeah, well, because people had to like him. I mean, Johnny Depp is a star, but like that movie, they made it seem like um, Johnny Depp's a threat, and the humans try to attack him, and then it turns out Johnny Depp was a good guy the whole time, trying to save the environment. So we don't know if AI would help us or hurt us, or if it has any motivation. Depends how you to, program it. Whatever the fuck. Yeah, it depends. Yeah, how you program it. Is it faking emotion? Is it not? Uh, what controls do we give it at first? You know, it's I've I have no idea, but smart people seem worried about it. And it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen eventually. It's just information processing. As we get better at that, then it's inevitable. It's a fascinating concept for storytelling, at the very least. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very interesting concept. When it comes down to it. Like, we're all programmed in our own ways, you know? Whether, yeah, I guess that's the great yeah. debate, isn't it? Whether you want to attribute, like, a creator to it or not, we're programmed by our DNA. Like, we have action mm -hmm. and reaction responses in the same way that you mm -hmm. could program an artificial intelligence to have. And I love, I love that it tackles those concepts. And even though it's not, like, a documentary, it doesn't really flesh out those concepts, it, you know, it, it provokes them and it gets you to think about them. And that's part yeah, of what I like got us to talk about, about this it. movie. It definitely gets mm -hmm. you thinking, yeah. Yeah, and definitely ahead of its time, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, the fact that they were talking about this shit, when did this come out? 10? 2001. 2001, so whenever. Ironically, yeah. yeah. The fact that they were talking about it back then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. An AI odyssey. <laughs> I mean, it's possible that if Kubrick did complete this project, that it would have been a sort of masterpiece on that level, you know? Who shame. knows? Yeah. Yeah, I wish he didn't die, but we all die, so. Oops. Mm hmm If only he could upload his consciousness to an AI. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Someone needs to save his hair so they can recreate him, and then he'll only live for a day and die when he goes to sleep. <laughs> it's funny what you said about the scripts, Alex, how there were, like, a bunch of different ones, and the writers were trying to make sense of them and make it cohesive, because it kind of felt like that. And I still like the movie, and I think as a whole it, it works, but it did feel like a bunch of pieces that were kind of melded together, and that's f just for me. But talking about it and watching it again, I do like it a lot better this time. Yeah, I can't figure out if I actually like it or if I just find the whole story around it really fascinating. You know what I mean? Like That's part of the it. The whole yeah. Kubrick into, you know, part of it. and the It's just really interesting, a really interesting film. Um, yeah. Not only what mm -hmm. it's about, but the whole story behind it. It's one of a kind. Yeah. It's just like, if you'd ask me if I'd recommend it to somebody, I would go, I don't know. It depends what you're looking for. Because, um, well, it's definitely not a kid's movie, although it's a fairy tale and has that fairy tale logic. I wouldn't say kids. Not at all, no. It's it. horrifying. Yeah. It is it's basically a horror movie. And, and the first scene is like, a, like a boardroom fucking people talking about AI using big words. I'm like, a kid wouldn't like this. No. But I don't think it's trying to be a kid's movie either. But again, it's Spielberg uses that schmaltzy, uh, the schmaltzy tricks he always uses, and it kind of bothered me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that he uses in kids' movies. He also does it to great effect, though. Like that scene where she abandons David. It's a really good scene. Yeah. It was a powerful scene. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It is confusing though. Like, how do you feel about that weird scene with the uh, Robin Williams? You know, and the you mentioned it earlier. Doctor No, kind of Google right. thing. That that like that scene was like I don't know about that shit. It was weird. <laughs> you know, you know Kubrick weird. directed Robin Williams' voice acting for that scene. What? Really? Yeah. Mm. I had no idea. Yeah, that was what, something that was done years before. Interesting. That's just it's just so many uh -huh. tidbits like that that are like, what is this film? How would it yeah. have looked if he'd done it? How, because like, just the design of that of that Robin Williams character he looks so kind of cartoony and goofy. I just would love to mm -hmm. see how Kubrick would have presented it. You know, mm -hmm. we can only. Speculate. I wondered if he would have done it ironically, like it had that goofy, you know, voice acting, but it was like a, a it looked like the monolith or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like it was just like this plain prop. Like you just don't know. Yeah, with these things. And then there's the crazy designs of the, like the city, like really sexual designs of like mouths with roads going into them and stuff like that, and the shady yep. yeah. underbelly stuff. 
just a very strange, interesting film. I have a couple issues with the, uh, I guess, the logic in a couple places. It's kind of nitpicky, but... That's what we do. Yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> the whole plot of the movie wouldn't have happened if there wasn't that element of, oh, yeah, once you imprint it, you can't possibly reset it. Like, there's no factory reset on this robot. You can't just revert to a factory setting, <laughs> you know? Yeah, you got to dispose of the whole thing. It's probably very expensive and uses up a lot of materials. Yeah, I don't know why they did that. You know? <laughs> I think yeah, it is because it's, it's just the mechanics of like like a fairy tale, isn't it? You know? Yeah, exactly. Like we, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's it. If you try to think about it logically, you it, got it falls apart. But at no point, yeah, do they think about it logically like that? Because the whole thing's quite fantastical. I found all of the whole subplot with the uh, framing for murder thing to be a little cheesy. Not just the fact that like the guy literally kissed her body. You know, and like you'd think that they would be able to figure out DNA evidence or maybe there would be like a log in the in Jude yeah. Law's AI that would show this or something, you know, be able to search his history and figure out if he did it. But then mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. also just like every time they caught him it was really goofy. They like used that helicopter and just like magneted him away. It was really whimsical. Yeah, I, wasn't I, it? I didn't really like that stuff. I like that character too. It's just sometimes they did stuff like that with the murder subplot I didn't like. But I thought Jude Law was very good in it. Mm -hmm. I would agree. It was a super weird, interesting character. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also liked um, his little brother, I guess, technically. But the kid in it, their son, who is comatose for a small part of the movie, but then he comes back. Mm -hmm. I liked how much of a dick he was. Yep. And <laughs> he was like jealous of. Uh, his his this fucking robot getting attention from his mother, so he would fuck with it and make it do things, and it, that that whole dynamic was really interesting too. Yeah. It seemed really sort of realistic of what an actual kid would do as well. Like I, I yeah. can put my myself into the kind of cruel shit I would do to like, you know, my brother when I was that age. Yeah, I could think of that too, and also just the reaction the the AI kid had to the other kid, the real kid, talk, calling him a toy and like touching him like he's a toy you could see in his eyes it was like hurting him a little bit that was great too the parents very clearly told him he was a toy we don't get to see this conversation and i would have loved to have seen that conversation but the parents clearly withhold that information from him so that they didn't have to say yeah we replaced you because we thought you weren't gonna get better <laughs> like so yeah i mean the kid's a dick but that was also partially his parents fault for literally just saying, oh, it's um, it's a new super toy. Have fun. You know, mm -hmm. I like yeah. how uh, the most likable character is the teddy bear, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, that was that was fun too. Fun comedic relief and actually appropriate. And he wasn't annoying. He, you actually enjoyed his character. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't yeah, annoying. Yeah, it was great. That could have really easily yeah. been like an annoying. Mm -hmm. Well, because you think of like other sidekicks who stick around to just tell jokes. Mm -hmm. but considering he was good and uh, i like the effects on him because some of it was animatronic some of it was cg some of the cg didn't look all that good but like it was still really cool spielberg knows how to blend the two he's very mm -hmm. good yeah at that. Mm -hmm. even when it's it's a little distracting but it's not that distracting when you see the cg he tried to hide it best he could if you notice yeah. it was all in sort of like dimly lit you know scenes like in busy scenes as well so there was more to distract the mm -hmm. eye Absolutely. He just knows what he's doing. That's that's yeah. the thing. It's so competent, you know, technically. Yeah. The the biggest hang ups are just with all the it does feel like there have been quite a few hands in the uh, soup pot, you know. Mm hmm. Mm. It does come across like that for every emotional scene with the where he's abandoned, then the crazy scene with the Google bot and the weird sexual set design and then the aliens at the end it's just a it's super just crazy it's very odd yeah and it's part uh -huh. of it's the, it's both a positive and a negative i'd say mm -hmm. like it's the the most interesting thing about it but it's also the most difficult thing to try and wrap your head around especially mm -hmm. for like average mainstream audiences like so many people hated the way that it ended because it just comes yeah it's just so bizarre and unexpected like you wouldn't expect yeah. the story to go there and end that way, especially. Exactly. And obviously it was promoted for a mainstream audience. 
Yeah. It's a Steven mm-hmm. Spielberg film. <laughs> it's not like Jurassic Park blockbuster Jaws, you know, satisfying, mm. is it? It's way more out there and requires you to do more reading and thinking about it. Mm-hmm. So I can, yeah. I'm, I'm not surprised that it's so controversial. Oh, yeah. But I still liked it. Yeah, as I say, it was for a film this long, for it to never be boring to me. It was really impressive. Mm-hmm. So many good shots as well. Just really yeah, well shot all around. Just, yeah. Just a crazy, awesome movie. We're all in agreement. We all like it. We all think it has merit. We have issues. Um, you have issues. So what would you rate it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. We all have issues. I don't actually, I don't know how to assign a number to this one. I really don't. Yeah. That's how I feel. I do. Six. Has <laughs> yours okay. stayed the same? Yeah. But I, I, I think it hasn't been as long since I've seen it also. I think I saw mm. it maybe like five or six years ago. But still, I mean, like, I feel the same way about it as I did the last time I watched it. My rating hasn't changed. But I'm glad I watched it again. I got more out of it, both in positive and negative ways. But it, it's good to refresh yourself on on films that uh, you find at least interesting. So yeah, six out of 10, enjoyable film, lots of great stuff, some cheesy stuff, some questionable choices, but overall uh, definitely worth a watch, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, same rating, three out of five. Three. Or six out of 10. Yeah. Got him. I, it used to be a two, but this time I got more out of it. So three. <laughs> Everything we've said, it's, it's a little cheesy, but it it's still good. Yeah, I'm I'm feeling between a three and and four somewhere in the middle, mm-hmm. just because it it is just so interesting, and yeah, I'd love to see like a documentary about the whole process of making it. You know, that would be a cool documentary. Yeah, it would. I wonder if it exists. Cool it. Have you guys looked if there is one? Probably not. DM documentary could be the name of it. What? <laughs> oh, yeah. I get it now. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's AI, artificial intelligence. We got we him. Did it. We got Kubrick. <laughs> He's gone now. Yeah. I I'm curious to see what people say in the comments on Reddit about this yeah. one. From our community yeah. what they think about this movie. It sucked. It was it dumb. Was gay. <laughs> it was dumb. <laughs> Fucking stupid. <laughs> it was really homophobic how Jude Law's character was like, he can please any woman and he didn't say woman or man. What? So there's no gay people in the future? Fuck you, Spielberg. <laughs> okay, yes or no? Would you fuck a Jude Law sex robot? Go. No. What? Um, well, he's quite convincing is the thing. <laughs> he does sort of sell his, his you know product, doesn't he? You can just close your well, eyes. He's got fucked up teeth. Jude Law has really fucked up teeth. I don't know if you see it really in this movie, but um, in Contagion, his teeth are all fucked. Well, that's because he was sick. <laughs> Wasn't that a prop like thing in that movie? <laughs> was it a prop? I thought that was just real I teeth. I thought for the first time I saw his real movie. British teeth. Yeah, well, He's then they must have given him fake teeth in this. I don't know what his real teeth all right, are like. Yeah. Either yeah. way. Yeah, if it, I guess if, if it was a Jude Law sex robot with perfect teeth, maybe I'd consider okay. it. <laughs> if I was a homosexual. Oh, if. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, yeah. Like, you, it, they're so advanced, and they're built for one purpose only. They're going to be better than any human being you fuck. Yeah, that That's was how many. they work. Yeah. Yeah, I can't wait. How many more years until we get these sex robots? <sighs> They've been promised Too many. For, uh, probably since 2001, since this movie. They already exist, don't they? Yeah, but they're like fucking a million dollars and like some dude in Japan has it. Like there's only <laughs> one. Like I I mean like a fucking factory of sex robots that are, you know, pristine. It's like 8.99 or 88.99 or something, like a low price. <laughs> I'm waiting for that. 8.99. <laughs> yeah, not 8.99. That's a little too cheap. <laughs> $899 sounds more reasonable. Yeah. All right. I guess we're going on to questions. Yeah, it's question yeah, time it. everybody. So if you want to leave your own questions for the Sardonicast crew to answer, head over to the Reddit page um, where Ralph leaves a nice thread where you can ask whatever you want and I'll sift through and find the questions that aren't about what our favorite movies are or whatever. 
<laughs> favorite music's normally the one, isn't it? The same same question over and over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's start with this one from um, Emmett underscore S22. What is your most anticipated movie of next year? He says, personally excited for Chaos Walking, the one you mentioned earlier, the Charlie Kaufman movie, right? Oh, okay. That's coming out next year, then probably that. Yeah, probably that. Is Anything that what else? it's called? Chaos Walking? Uh, that's what this Reddit oh. thing says. I can okay. double check that while you think. Okay, yeah. The title of the book is just so different. I didn't realize that's what the... Uh... Chaos Walking, yeah. Is written in okay. the screenplay. Okay, wait a minute. Okay, I guess that's it. So he's not even directing it. I didn't know that. No, he's not Shit. directing it. Okay, well, Doug I'm a little Lemon. less excited for it now, but hopefully uh, he has a lot of creative control i don't know fuck we'll see what happens the director of american made john wick three damn john, wick, john wick three yeah he's on a fucking horse now really yeah it's gonna be awesome i can't wait for john wick three once upon a time in hollywood by tarantino yeah that was gonna That's be my out. one jordan peele's uh, new movie mm-hmm. supposed to come out next year Ooh. what is it called us toy story four. Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> we got Dumbo. We got the Lion King. Stop. Uh, you know, I, I am curious how this um like Hellboy thing is gonna be like. Yeah, we'll see. It's uh the guy from Stranger Things, right? It's the guy from Stranger What's Things, directed by the guy who did The Descent. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, so it's good people. Ooh, it Chapter Two. Oh yeah. Ugh. Angry Birds Two. Joker. <laughs> I'm hoping for that one. <laughs> Star Wars Episode Nine. Whee! Glass. Who wants to see that. We got Detective Pikachu. A lot of shit, basically. We got The Secret Life of Pets Two. Yeah. Oh, that's Without one for me. Without Louis C.K. Right? Who's Who's the, Is it Pat Oswalt? Yeah, so yeah. Louis C.K. It is. And Secret Life of Pets. That's funny. <laughs> they just got another fat comedian. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <sighs> Oops. Yeah, I don't know. I, there's probably a lot of things that I'm more excited for than what I can find by Googling 2019 movies. But I would have to go through yeah. like each of the director's IMDb profiles and see what their what their upcoming things are. Why don't I go into my fucking watch list? That's a good idea. Because I probably added some things. You, you guys fill up more time by saying some things here. What do you think? Uh, do you think the Lego Movie 2 has any hope? Um, oh, I don't know. It's not the same guy. I didn't they, even do Lego it, Batman, right? honestly. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, didn't I haven't seen it. Lego Ninjago. <laughs> yeah, I haven't um, seen Ninjago, but surely they'll put more effort into the Lego Movie 2, right? Because the first one's quite beloved, isn't it? I hope so. There's the new Avengers also, the part two. Yeah, I'm excited to see that. Of... Yeah, that would be nice. Um, There's an Elton John <laughs> movie. <laughs> Once You guys want to hear about Elton John? No. Oh, Spider-Man? How about Alita Battle Angel? Yeah, Sp- oh, Spider-Man, okay. How about Rambo 5 with um Stallone, who's like 98 years old We're still now. making those? Yeah, he's I like guess. in the fucking West. He's old as hell, he has a hat on, he's in a wheelchair. He's got an oxygen tank and a shotgun. Great. Okay, we got a uh, new uh, Bong Joon-ho movie coming out in 2019 called Parasite. Oh, cool. Hmm. We got The Beach Bum by Harmony Kareen, starring Matthew McConaughey and Snoop Dogg. <laughs> that should be interesting. <laughs> Dora the Explorer, 2019. Oh, we got nice. Happy Death Day to You. <laughs> That's oh, good. that looks really bad. I'm sure it's uh, going to be Shazam. great. Shazam. Yeah. The Addams Family? Oh, come on. They're making another Addams Family? They're making a movie about my family? Really? I thought they did one of those a couple years ago. Oh, no, that was Dark Shadows. But I thought, oh, am, I, am I going crazy? <laughs> I know, but the, oh, they did do an Adams Family I remake. Oh, yeah. like 1990, Christina Ricci's in it. No, yeah, we know about that um, one. But yeah, Dark Shadows was not an Adams Family. Was it, technically? Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. I didn't watch it. Of, uh, I, I think know. so. No, it's, it has nothing to do with Adams Family, but it had like, the Burton same thing, feel. Right? Yeah, it was another Tim Burton classic. Um, <laughs> Escape Room. I'll watch it, but what? it's going to be bad. Looks awful. Kim Possible? <laughs> <laughs> what? Are they making a like, live action Kim Possible movie? You, you serious? <laughs> Are you going through your yeah. watch list right now? 
No, I'm going to <laughs> just movies coming out in 2019. Yeah, I, I, I'm not that interested in a Kim Possible movie. And a Sonic the Hedgehog movie with Ooh, Jim Carrey. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> what the fuck is that? <laughs> oh, boy. Everything just has to be live action. I'm sure that uh, I'll find more movies I'm actually interested in seeing in the comments section for people reminding me that my favorite directors are still making movies. <laughs> so Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're all they'll all be for Netflix. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. You never know. So I can just sit at home and watch them. <laughs> okay. Uh okay. We got one from Sitonacast who says Do you guys care if a movie based on a true story takes creative freedoms in the writing process? Uh no, because they all do. They have to. Like, the most accurate uh, depiction of something that really happened is probably United 93. Like, that movie, uh, Paul oh, yeah. Greengrass tried to, like, as accurate as he could replicate what happened from, from you know, what's, what's recorded on the plane. He got actors that looked like the real people on yeah. the plane. But that's, like, the most realistic I can think of. Most movies, they have to fucking make up something so that the story structure makes sense. And, you know, you just have to accept it. There's that uh, YouTube channel History Buffs that goes into detail about those sorts of things. If anybody's looking mm -hmm. for some content to watch. Yeah, it never bugs me. Um, it only bugs me when it's like, I guess when horror movies try to do it because it's so yeah. obviously bullshit. <laughs> like the ghost things. Well, that's not even trying. It's like this was based yeah, exactly. on a true story. Like, okay. <laughs> Maybe when they first yeah, started doing that, it. it was a good marketing thing. But for me, it just makes me roll my eyes at this point. The strangers. Mm -hmm. It's like the only people that were left to tell the story are dead. So you made up the whole movie. <laughs> and the true story was <laughs> somewhere people died. And then yeah, the rest somewhere. is just bullshit. Uh-huh. <laughs> I like how in Fargo, it says based on a true story, but it's just... Oh, yeah intentionally just bullshit like they yeah they never they weren't even pretending it's funny yeah. it's just kind of poking fun at it and that was in 95 yeah <laughs> they're still doing mm -hmm. it to this day it depends on how they it's done because it like i i like kind of alternate history things too you could make a movie that's mm -hmm. based on a true story and add in things that are clearly fictional but it elevates the story yeah what like inglorious bastards or something where he blows up hitler <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, that all really happened, though. <laughs> Until World War II ended. <laughs> yeah, depends on the movie. It's all about presentation. Mm -hmm. It also depends, um, like, what's changed. Because if, you like, if you're, like, telling so a, a true story and you just lie about things that happened that are pretty important. Yeah. That, like, would change to the morals of the villain or the hero. Like, if you leave something out like that, then it's yeah. a little insulting. Yeah. I, I'm trying to think of an example. American but... Sniper got some heat for that. Yeah. Apparently the yeah. guy was just like an asshole. Made, <laughs> like if you made a movie about the Holocaust from the point of view of Nazis or something, like that's when you should fucking watch it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If it's something sensitive, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if it's something sensitive, then you got to try to be a bit more accurate unless you're trying to like do some kind of satire. Mm. But then you wouldn't say based on a true story. <laughs> okay, we got one from Artsy Film Student who says, do you think that there is a certain point when a film becomes porn? I'm talking about films like Antichrist that have actual non-simulated sex in them. Or is there no real limit to how much sexuality can be in a film to distinguish it from a porn? Um, I would consider many other films that didn't show unsimulated sex to be more pornographic than Antichrist. Like, just because mm -hmm. they, got, they got body doubles in Antichrist, but... Mm -hmm fucking like blue is the warmest color turned into porn for 20 minutes even if the actors weren't having <laughs> yeah. sex you know like there there was a point where it's like okay you're not really learning anything about the characters anymore you're just trying to give the male audience members a boner here you know like that's yeah. that's uh, how it was for me anyway not that i got a boner uh. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i don't know the the difference I guess it's the like if intent. there's if there's purpose, yeah, it's the intent and the purpose of it. Well, uh, yeah. I just watched some short film about like a BDSM couple. I forgot the name of it. I should probably look it up. But like it was it was written by the BDSM couple, and like it was pretty fucking hardcore shit they were showing. But 
it was the point of the movie was like she's into those things and she accepts it and she likes it. So I don't know if that's pornographic because she has a point. It's not just to arouse people. It's to fucking show how a relationship like that works. What about like in, um, in shame? It's the whole point of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Just because something's graphic doesn't mean it's a fucking porn, but if something's shown without intent just to get you off, then then it starts to get pornographic. I just, I don't know. I, I It feels odd that it's even really considered graphic, especially in America, to show sex, you know? Yeah, it's just, it's Americans a, are very weird about sex, sex and nudity. Yeah. We, we sh- yeah, I know, We but we shy away from it. It's just a part of our culture. Yeah. We just don't like talking about repression. it. Repression. Really. Yeah, <laughs> repression. Whereas we love showing sex in the UK, yeah. Yeah, in Europe it's big. Fucking France, forget it. <laughs> People fuck in the streets. <laughs> Neither of you guys have seen Short Bus, correct? No. no. That's a film that was made that is like a real story, but with money shots. So it's like the actors mm. are all fucking <laughs> throughout the movie, but it's like a real story, and it's actually pretty good. Right. Yeah. What about like torture porn? It's a yeah, bit of a spin on the question, but like, it's not that much different, is it? If the whole film Hostile. just exists to show. I mean, I don't know. Do people like jerk off to Saw? I mean, there must be somebody. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's someone who jerks Some off to everything. Some people love that shit, man. <laughs> Some people jerk off to this podcast, probably. <laughs> so, I don't know. I guess anything could be porn. Yeah, like Saw is just funny though. Like, oh, I love it. <laughs> That's how I feel about torture porn. It's like, really? You're going to take this shit seriously? It's so fucking dumb. Like, you're actually offended by Saw. What about, um, like, a Serbian film? Is that what it's called? Yeah, that was yeah. just shock value and nothing else. That yeah, was that just, was just shock value. There wasn't anything really substantive there. Yeah, that's how I felt about it, too. Well, I don't know where the line is, but uh, for me, I guess just as soon as it starts to feel as though there's no point to it, and it's just like, okay, yeah. well... This is for your sexual gratification and nothing else. Then it's like, this might as well be porn. You know? Yeah. In the US, a judge said, talking about porn, she said, I'll know it when I see it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, that's that's how I feel. And that's what I was thinking as well. Yeah. I know it when I see it. IX12 says, have you ever experienced a time where you were really enjoying a movie all the way through until it completely fell apart in its third act? Yes. Um, is a poorly executed third act enough to ruin an entire movie for you? Yeah. Yes. Many times. And I feel I feel like the third act is like one of the most common places for a film to f- fall apart. Yeah. You know, because mm-hmm. it doesn't really fall apart if it was shitty from the get go. And usually when you set up a story, it's like, OK, now I'm interested in seeing where these characters are going and how this universe works. And then they just can't figure out how to fucking end it. Because the ending mm-hmm. is something where yeah. it's like, okay, on paper, you, you in the checklist of things that you need to make this a film, you have to have an ending. And perhaps this concept of the film was never even made with an ending considered. And then it's just like, okay, well, mm-hmm. now I have to wrap this up and get it going somewhere. Oftentimes, it's it's either sloppy or rushed or just... Formulaic. ...betrays the, the entire first two-thirds of the film. There's several movies I feel that way about, one of them being Source Code, 2011 film starring Jake Gyllenhaal, mm. directed by Duncan Jones. I don't know if you guys saw it. Yeah, I I've love I've seen that it movie. a long time ago. I hated yeah. the ending. I hated it so much. <laughs> I, li- I like the ending. I hated it. It should have ended it's, uh... on the freeze frame. That would have been the perfect ending, and then they just kept going. Well, if you go with the theory of, uh, I guess, uh, I don't want to spoil Source Code. <laughs> yeah. Multiple realities, different realities. Sure. It could make sense. Sure. I am legend. Right there. Yeah, I am legend. Yeah, one. That's a good um, one. Recently, I don't know how you guys feel, but Widows, I didn't like the ending of Widows. I think it all kind of fell apart at the end. I can see why you would think that. Try not to spoil Widows. I really liked it. Yeah, overall. I don't want to spoil Widows. Yeah. yeah, I enjoyed it. I liked it too, till the end. Zombieland, oh, terrible yeah. third act. Yeah. Well, a lot of these movies, like you said, Adam, they sell these movies on the premise and then they write the first two thirds and then they're like, I don't know. So they usually go with like the formulaic ending, like, the you know, the Hollywood template, like, oh, yeah. okay. So they, 
they stop the threat and they all go in a car and then drive off into the sunset. Like that's usually how it ends, and it's always just shit. <laughs> if the movie ends like that. And then you have times where the movie is perfectly fine and J.J. Abrams comes in and ruins it like 10 Cloverfield Lane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where if you just cut off the movie 10 minutes early, it's a fucking that's great movie. That's a is like a fourth act. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like that's over. why I don't even consider that one. Like, you can literally just cut the movie fucking when she sees that alien ship or even before that when she just gets out and then that's it. Just end it there. And it's a great movie. Um, mm-hmm. I really don't like the third act of Interstellar. Yeah. Yeah. For I me, that's that. when it kind of crumbles under yeah, its own. Yeah, I guess so. But Interstellar's like all over the place the whole movie. Like there's, sh- there's shit in the beginning and middle that's bad too. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then there's stuff that's great at the end and stuff that's great in the middle. and it- It's all over the place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So to answer your question, yes, that happens. <laughs> <laughs> is, is a bad ending worse than like a bad beginning? It must uh, be right. I... I guess it's what it's what stays with you, right? So the last yeah. thing you yeah. you experience. But also, like a bad beginning, it makes you not even want to watch the movie. They're <laughs> you obviously know? both like, important. I don't know which one's worse. But like, if an ending is really atrocious, it just leaves a sour taste, doesn't it? Especially. Yeah. True. Yeah, I guess you're right. Like, if if a movie gets progressively better, I give it more points. Like, if it starts out bad, but then earns like it's it earns itself for I guess what's the word I'm looking for? But it gets better as it goes along. Finds its like, footing. Okay. It finds its footing. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I guess we've got a uh, film recommendation. Yes. From you. Yeah. This time. I guess so. I I hadn't really decided. Uh, I was be- between a couple, but I guess why not? Fuck it. People have been wanting me to talk about this for a long time. The Holy Mountain from 1973. Alejandro Hodorowski. I think maybe you guys have seen it before or parts of it. I don't know. But either way, it's something that I would like to talk about and I think would be an interesting discussion. It is my favorite movie ever made. And uh, it's one that I would like to encourage more people to see for sure. Nice. It's going to make your brain hurt. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's, so. yeah, it's a challenging film, is all I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, don't expect a traditional narrative structure. <laughs> don't, don't, don't expect, expect a traditional anything. <laughs> don't expect any movie you've ever seen before is yeah. how to watch that movie. <laughs> okay, I'm excited. Um, yeah, me too. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of Sardonicast. If you would like to support the show, or get the episodes early as they're edited before they're public, head to sardonicast.com and sign up for premium. Or go to patreon.com slash sardonicast. Also, what the fuck are you doing? We have t-shirts. Go get get those now. It, it, the link is in the description. Should, it's Christmas. It's Christmas. What are you going to do? You got to get yeah, a Christmas present. Reason. You got to do it now. <laughs> bye 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 B-U-Y <laughs> B-U-Y B-Y-E bye 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 <laughs>